Welcome back to Canon Law in Exile. This is video 10 and it is lesson 8b and we're continuing on with particular churches and uh, we're discussing especially dioceses and parishes today. In our last video, also on lesson 8, we talked more about groupings of dioceses and also uh, entities that are analogous to dioceses, like territorial uh, abbey, um, apostolic uh, prefecture, etc. Okay, so if you want to follow along in Woodall, this is uh, picking up around page 152. It's an interesting issue arises um, every now and then when a bishop is appointed. And uh, you may have wondered about this, you may not, but it's at least somewhat interesting. When does the bishop actually actually um, have authority in a diocese? A newly appointed bishop. A lot of different, a uh, lot of different dates that you could pick. Is it when he is when he's appointed? Is it when the nuncio calls him and he agrees to, to take the to take the position? Is it when he's you know when he's appointed? Is it when he arrives there? What is the actual uh, what is the actual marker where he's in authority over the diocese? This is provided in Canon three eighty two, and it is when he takes possession takes possession or the taking of possession of the diocese. He needs to take take possession of the diocese in order to truly be in authority. What does that mean? It means that he shows his apostolic letters to the College of Consultors. Uh, College of Consultors is a group of a small group of priests in the diocese, so we'll talk about it in a little while. Um, and the apostolic letter is the letter appointing him. So he shows his apostolic letter or letters to the College of Consultors in the presence of the Chancellor. That's what, that's when he takes possession and the Chancellor reviews them and makes sure that they're authentic. Okay, so now let's talk about the diocesan curia. We talked a little bit about the Roman Curia. Um, by analogy, the diocese also has a Curia. Um, and what the officers of the Curia do is um, they help the bishop administer the diocese, and they also exercise judicial power. Kind of the person usually more or less in charge of the curia or at least kind of the organizer or you might call uh might call him chief of staff something like that if you're familiar with political terms that person would be the moderator of the curia moderator there is not always a moderator of the curia um but uh if there is he's the kind of the person who um who kind of oversees the various offices of the curia and um, who is, as I say, kind of a, a chief of a chief of staff. Okay. Um, and he, uh, he, he must be a, a, a priest according to Canon 473. Our next officer who we've talked about quite a bit already is the vicar general. And, uh, um, if, if there's a coadjutor bishop or an auxiliary bishop, especially if there's only one, he is going to be the vicar general. Uh, if there are more than one, say there are two, two auxiliaries, one will be the vicar general and the other will be the episcopal vicar. Um, the uh, vicar general has ordinary vicarious power. We talked about that recently when we distinguished vicarious from proper 
power in discussing the diocesan bishop. Uh, there must be a vicar general. That's in Canon 475, and there's only one. The vicar general cannot also be the canon penitentiary, um, and he cannot be related to the bishop closer, closer than first cousin. Um, fourth degree in the collateral line is another way to say first cousin, but but if he's brother, father, or something that's too closely related, he has to be um, he has to be uh, not a first cousin or somebody closer than that. He could be more distant. If he's a second cousin, that's more distant. That would be okay. Um, if he is not a bishop, the vicar general, if there is no auxiliary or coadjutor, then the vicar general is appointed for a specific term. Now, he's the, he's a vicar, right? He has vicarious power. His power derives from the diocesan bishop. So, when the diocesan uh, bishop leaves or dies or resigns when he um, when the see becomes vacant, then the judicial or I'm sorry the vicar general's uh, uh, his power expires. That's in Canon four eighty one. Okay, let's move on to episcopal vicars. Now, as we said, um, episcopal vicar also like the vicar general has ordinary vicarious power, but his power is usually kind of for a sector. Um, it could be a geographic sector. Say there's a um, north, south, and, and west regions in the diocese, and each one has an Episcopal vicar. Uh, that, that, would be, that would be fine. But he has the authority only for his own sector. So it may be geographic, but it may be something else could be, say, the Episcopal vicar for uh, Hispanic ministry. Then his authority is over Hispanic parishes or Hispanic faithful, etc. Um, if you're in the north, let's say there's an Episcopal vicar, vicar for the north of the diocese, and you need a dispensation, you want to get married, you need a dispensation, and you cannot find your own Episcopal vicar for the north sector, can you go to the Episcopal Vicar for the South Sector? No, you cannot. Um, the Episcopal Vicar for the South Sector, he has ordinary vicarious authority, but only in the Southern Sector. So who do you go to? You can't find the, your own Episcopal Vicar. You would have to find the Vicar General. He's Vicar for the whole diocese, generally, or the diocesan bishop. He also obviously uh, could uh, could dispense. Okay, next office in the diocese, the chancellor. The chancellor, um, this is on 150, page 155, and uh, the canons are 482 and 483. Uh, this can be a lay person, and it can be a man or a woman. Uh, one of the jobs of the chancellor is to keep documents secure, and uh, he or she also is a notary, an ecclesiastical notary. And uh, this can be somewhat important in the church to have a, uh, a note, not just a notary, but an ecclesiastical uh, notary to be able to notarize, uh, uh, notarize church documents. Interestingly, um, or let's just raise the question, does the chancellor lose office when the see becomes vacant. Um, well, it seems like it. I mean, the chancellor's obviously lower than the vicar general, and the vicar general loses authority, so why shouldn't the chancellor? That's wrong, though. No, the chancellor stays in office. Uh, why is that? So the, the bishop dies, but the chancellor remains chancellor. Why is that? We've already discussed it. We said, how does the bishop, the new bishop, assume authority. He has to show his letters to the College of Consultors and to the Chancellor. The Chancellor has to authenticate those letters. Um, so the Chancellor has to be in office. We can't have we can't have the new bishop appointing the Chancellor because he may not be entitled to be bishop if there's a problem with his apostolic letters. So uh, so the Chancellor keeps his or her office even when the C becomes vacant. Okay, um, 
the Diocesan Finance Committee and Financial Administrator. Those two are quite important. Let's talk about the Finance Committee first. Sometimes in the U.S. this will be called the Finance, uh, the finance Council. Uh, Woodall says Finance Committee. That's fine, but just keep in mind there's there, you, there may be a there may be a slightly different term depending on where you are. Uh, this is going to be the committee or council is going to be three members of the faithful. Often they will be lay people, and they should be experts in finance and civil law. And they're appointed for five years, and um, kind of like the vicar general, they cannot be related too closely to the bishop. They can't be his first cousins or more closely related. Um, okay. Uh, what about the financial administrator? This is Canon 494. The financial administrator is appointed by the diocesan bishop after he consults with the finance committee or council and also with the College of Consultors, this small group of priests that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the finance administrator financial administrator is appointed for five years. Again, this this term could be different in different places. Don't worry about that too much. It'll be clear who the person is. I've seen the person in a religious com community called the Bursar, B-U-R-S-A-R. Um, in, uh, in Italian, sometimes they're called the Economo, E-C-O-N-O-M-O. -O -O. Um, it might be some other term, but it's going to be something like that, financial administrator. He's uh, He or she is appointed for five years, and that's renewable. Really important provision here. The admin financial administrator is removable only for a grave reason and only after the bishop consults the finance committee and the College of Consultors. This is quite remarkable. Uh, the bishop appoints the financial administrator. Again, he needs to consult before he does that um, with the uh, Finance Committee and College of Consultors, but he can't just get rid of his financial administrator. He has to have a grave reason. So it's quite a, quite a high standard. Uh, for so many other things, the bishop is allowed to decide if he only has a, a just reason. And a, a just reason really means any, really any good reason. Ah, uh, we just can't work together. Um, something like, something like that would, would be a just reason. Would not be a grave reason, though. Um, Okay, what are the duties of the finance committee and the financial administrator? Preparing budgets and annual accounts are very significant duties. Also, they administer the temporal goods of the diocese, the property. When we say temporal goods, that's the way canon law describes church property. Um, as you've seen here, especially with the term in office and the removability provisions, there's a, a, quite a bit of independence, especially with the financial administrator, but with the finance committee too. So this is probably, if um, uh, it, it's probably one of the most significant, uh, I don't know what you would call it, sort of counterbalances to the to the bishop's authority. It's it's something where he. Um, uh, can't just decide what he wants to do and do it, but he's more restricted by the law than in, than in many other areas. What else do these uh, entities do? The if if the bishop is um, going to uh, has a has a um, something of great financial significance that he wants to do, uh, then he's going to have to. Uh, get the not just the consultation but the consent of the uh, finance council or finance committee when we um, at the end of the semester we're going to try to we we're not we're not going to have a lesson on temporal goods but we try to circulate some notes and you'll see the finance committee mentioned there we won't go into too much detail but just have in mind if it's a if it's a of a 
certain significance, a financial transaction, then he's the bishop is actually going to need the the uh, not just consultation but consent of the finance committee. Um, and the same with transferring property of a certain value if he wants to get rid of a particularly valuable uh, property in the diocese. He um, and the bishop also must, well, I think we've said this, has to consult the finance committee before appointing or removing a financial administrator. Okay, so really a really a very interesting, very interesting provisions there for finance committee and uh, financial administrator. And you can kind of see it in part growing out of Vatican II with trying to uh, find more places for the laity to exercise their expertise uh, in the church, etc. Okay, let's go on to another officer in the diocese. The judicial vicar, now what I'll call some the vicar judicial, that's fine. We usually, almost always in the U.S., say JV or judicial vicar. Um, and uh, he also sometimes is called the officialis. Now, really anybody who's called a vicar, like a, a vicar for a... Um, for a, uh, a bishop is going to have to be a priest. So the judicial vicar is going to be a priest, just like the Episcopal vicar, just like the vicar general are. Okay, so the judicial the the judicial vicar obviously is going to um, have a great influence and responsibility over the tribunal in the diocese. Now the Diocesan bishop is the chief judge, but he does not usually exercise this power personally. At least that's most of the tradition, but as we'll see next semester in Canon Law 2, uh, Pope Francis is trying to get bishops more involved in actually exercising their judicial authority. Uh, there, there must be a judicial vicar. That's Canon 1420. Bishop must, as with a vicar general, he must have a judicial vicar. Uh, and he may also appoint associate uh, judicial vicars and judges for the tribunal. And all of them, the judges, the judicial vicar, and the associate judicial vicar or judicial vicars, uh, they have ordinary vicarious power. They're deriving their power from, from the bishop. However, interestingly here, None of them, the judicial vicar or the associate judicial vicar or the judge uh, or the judges, however many there are, none loses their office when the see becomes vacant, like the vicar general does and the episcopal vicar. They lose their, they lose their office when the see becomes vacant. Also, if you get a diocesan administrator for a while before you get your new bishop, he cannot remove the judicial vicar or the associate judicial vicar. Um, why is this? Again, we usually think of vicar general being uh, sort of, quote, higher than judicial vicar. Um, that may not be a fair thing to say because they really have very different jobs, so it may not be fair to compare them, but uh, certainly much more high profile to be a vicar general. Um, so why does the vicar general lose his position with a vacancy, but the judicial vicar does not? Uh, I don't know. The code doesn't really tell us, but I think it probably stands to reason that we probably want the cases that are going through the tribunal uh, to keep going. We don't want them to stop and people to lose their authority to rule on the cases just because we have a uh, just because we have a different bishop, who the bishop is is not usually going to have much influence over um, how a particular marriage case is decided. So that, that seems to be the reason. Okay, so much for the tribunal personnel. Uh, Woodall tells us there are two, two new bodies that are new in the Code of Canon Law. Um, that the judicial, I'm sorry, that the diocesan bishop is required to establish. One is called the Council of Priests, and Woodall discusses this on 158, uh, often in the U.S. called the Presbyteral Council. Again, there's going to, 
could be other terms as well, but either council of priests or presbyteral council. And what they do is they represent the presbyterium. They represent the body of, of priests in the diocese. Um, but they meet only when they're called by the diocesan bishop. And the council, it, it ceases to exist if the see is vacant. It may sound uh, something like the College of Bishops, that we don't, essentially the head is gone, so uh, there, there, isn't, there isn't authority there um, of, the, of the Council of Priests, as we say with the College of Bishops, too. The Council of Priests has only a consultative vote, only an advisory vote, but sometimes the bishop must consult with them. For instance, if he wants to uh, create a new parish or suppress close down a parish. Canon 515 says he must consult the Council of Priests. Um, also, um, if uh, he wants to reduce a church building to secular use, to essentially secularize a, a church building, he also has to consult the uh, Council of Priests first, and, and also to build a new church as well. There are some other other things that, uh, other times when he needs to consult them, for instance, holding a synod. Um, diocesan synods, are, I think, are pretty rare. So you, you'll see that you'll see that in Woodall. You'll see it in the canons. But but the main things are especially new parishes, closing a parish, building a new church, or secularizing a, a new church. He needs to consult the council of priests. Okay. Um, then there's another body called the College of Consultors. And the Consultors are it's a much smaller body. It's uh, only 6 to 12 members, and they're chosen by the diocesan bishop from the Council of Priests. And um, what the Consultors do, uh, they kind of consul consult, obviously, with the bishop, but they also uh, they can elect a diocesan administrator when the see is vacant. Also, as we've said a few minutes ago, for financial uh, transactions of great significance, great value, great monetary value, the diocesan bishop must, uh, must consult with them, and he also must consult with them in appointing or removing a financial administrator. Uh, and for transactions above a certain dollar amount, the, he needs not only the consultation with the College of Consultors, but he actually needs their approval. Okay, the Canon Penitentiary. We've talked about the Canon Penitentiary. This is the um, the person in charge of the internal forum of lifting lifting penalties and and so forth. Really talked about him, I think, quite a bit in in our lesson six on penal loss. We don't have a whole lot to say. He's the one who can absolve latte sententiae censures as long as they have not yet been declared and they're not reserved to the Holy See. Who can he assist? He can assist subjects of the diocese or subjects of the diocesan bishop who are within the diocese or who are outside the diocese or he can exist. Not, he can help or lift the penalties for non-diocesan faithful who are present in the diocese. Um, so we're talking about Evansville, an Evansville layperson or priest, an Evansville faithful member of the faithful in Evansville, can get a penalty lifted by the by the canon penitentiary. The same person, even if he crosses the border into the uh, Diocese of Springfield, Illinois, he, um, he also still could get the penalty lifted by the Evansville Canon Penitentiary. Who else could? He comes back to Evansville and brings a friend who also needs a penalty lifted from Springfield. Well, now that the Springfield person is present in Evansville, the Canon Penitentiary can lift his penalty as well. But remember... If it's a latte, it's a latte sententiae censure that has not been declared, and it's not reserved to the Holy See. Um, and recall the 
exceptions, etc., that we that we talked about in lesson six. Okay, that's the end of uh, diocesan kind of personnel. Let's talk a little bit about parishes. Um, for parishes, Woodall tells us this is, starts on page one sixty two. Woodall describes the parish as the preeminent community in the diocese. I think he's very right to say that. And then he also says, but uh, that doesn't mean that the diocesan bishop is the pastor. And again, he's quite correct. The, the pastor is the priest entrusted with the pastoral care of the, uh, of the parish. The diocesan bishop has supervision, but he is not the pastor of the parish itself. We've got a definition of a parish in Canon 515, Section 1. A parish is a certain community of Christ's faithful, stably established within a particular church, whose pastoral care under the diocesan bishop is entrusted to a parish priest as its proper pastor. So some key points to remember are that um, a parish is a community. We're going to define a parish as a as a community, and it's stably established. It's meaning that it's um, we don't want to we don't want to set up a parish and then have to close it down in six months. We're only going to set it up if it's something that we believe is going to uh, go on into the future for quite some time, perhaps indefinitely, uh, and. The head of the parish, the only legal representative of the parish, is the pastor, and the pastor is a is a priest. Um, a note on the term pastor: in the U.S., we describe the priest in charge of a parish as the pastor, usually. In um, most of the rest of the English-speaking world, Canada um, and and Britain, he's usually described as the parish priest. So in English-speaking countries outside the U.S., you're probably going to see the term parish priest more commonly than pastor. Just keep that in mind. Um, okay, the, uh, as we said, only the diocesan bishop can establish a parish or can suppress it. Uh, and again, he must consult with the Council of Priests before doing so. A parish usually has a specific territory, so... That's usually how it's defined, but it can also be personal. So it can be not just, hey, it's this many blocks from this highway to this highway, but it can also be, no, we're the parish for the Vietnamese faithful in this area, or we're the parish for the um, for the Italian faithful or, or whatever. Usually, usually it's one of, uh, often if it's going to be a personal parish, it's going to be along the lines of uh, an ethnic determination of a specific ethnic group but there can be other there can be other uh, uh, there can be other bases for uh, a personal parish as well the the pastor like the bishop has to take possession of his parish that's when he comes into authority and we'll talk in just a moment about that as we say only a priest can be a pastor and only the diocesan bishop can appoint him uh, there's going to be we're going to see one exception to that how does the bit how does the priest take possession of the parish this is in canon 527 unfortunately it's less uh less well defined than how a bishop takes possession of a diocese. What uh, the law says is that the, the ordinary gives the pastor a limit within which he is to take possession, and um, the procedure that he does so is determined by particular law or local custom. However, this procedure can be dispensed, so the ordinary could just say, okay, you don't need to do whatever that procedure is. We're just going to deem you to be in possession. Uh, I think probably in some places, maybe the pa the new pastor's first mass, maybe that would constitute his his taking of possession, something like that. Uh, if you know in your own diocese uh, how how a, uh, a pastor takes possession, certainly feel free to, uh, to share that. How long is a pastor appointed for? There are two options. He, he either is appointed for an indefinite period He's just appointed with no 
end period established, or he's appointed for a, a term of years. Um, in the U.S., it's very common for pastors to be appointed for a term of six years and then for that term of six to be renewed once. So usually, um, a, 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 it's very, not usually, but very commonly, a, a priest will, a pastor will, will be in office for 12 years. But there can be reasons for that to change uh, as, as well. Uh, normally, a priest should be appointed pastor of only one parish. Um, we, we said that only the diocesan bishop appoints a pastor to a parish. Uh, however, let's say there's a diocesan administrator. We don't have a new bishop yet. If the priest already has been nominated, then the diocesan administrator can put him in possession of his parish. However, he cannot appoint a pastor unless the see, the diocese, has been vacant or impeded for more than a year. So we've got a, a fairly big difference here between the authority of the bishop and a diocesan administrator. Okay, uh, our next office, a parochial administrator, page 168 in Woodall. This is uh, someone who's appointed when a pastor cannot fulfill his duties because of exile, illness, imprisonment, etc. Um, he cannot make major changes in the parish uh, because he's not the pastor. The administrator is not the pastor. And Woodall uh, expresses a very strong opinion on page 169. He calls it a gross abuse to use appointment of a parochial administrator to avoid appointing a pastor. Um, some bishops prefer to appoint a parochial administrator rather than a pastor. Why might they prefer this? Well, it's easier to remove a parochial administrator, and especially if it's the priest's first first uh, assignment, not first assignment, but first assignment as pastor, the bishop may want to see how it goes for a period before actually appointing him as pastor. Uh, Woodall very strongly disagrees with this, though. He says that... Uh, the, the priest should be appointed as, as pastor. And uh, there's something to be said for Woodall's argument, because remember how we defined what a parish is. The very definition said it's a certain community of the faithful, stably established, stability very important in the parish. And because of that, the pastor also has stability in office. It's not that easy to remove a, a pastor. Um, and... Uh, by, by definition, the parish is a community headed by a parish priest as pastor. So if we've got a priest, but he's only parochial administrator, it sounds like Woodall's saying, look, we're, we're um, really kind of putting a, a hindrance on this parish. So this may be something, having a parochial administrator that uh, before becoming a pastor that occurs in your diocese. Um, so uh, feel free to to consider Woodall's opinion. I think Woodall, he, he calls it an abuse to kind of habitually use appointments of parochial administrators rather than pastors. Uh, perhaps Perhaps he'd be less troubled if the period of the parochial administrator were relatively short. Say he was only administrator for six months or nine months or something, just to make sure he could handle the work. And then when that was clear, then appointed him uh, fully as pastor. Perhaps Woodall would be less less troubled by that than by having someone in office as parochial administrator for, say, a full two or three years uh, before becoming pastor or without a pastor ever being appointed. So anyway, interesting uh, interesting issue. Okay, what are the responsibilities of the parish priest? These are listed in Canon 528 through 530, instruction of the laity, and Woodall discusses them on 170. Instruction of the laity, proclamation of the word of God, bringing the gospel to non-practicing faithful, uh, fostering devout celebration of the sacraments, 
guarding against liturgical abuses, correcting those in error, and ensuring that the sick and dying are cared for. There also are certain functions that are especially entrusted to the pastor, but not exclusively. And these are listed and discussed by Woodall at 171. Uh, a couple of them are administering baptism, administering confirmation, administering viaticum, assisting at marriages. Why do we say these are especially entrusted to the pastor, but not exclusively? Well, they're especially entrusted to the pastor because he's the head of the community. Bringing new people into the community through baptism or uh, putting people into a new state through marriage are very significant events both in an individual's life, but in the life of the parish, too. So so they're especially entrusted to the pastor. Well, if they're so important, why don't we say they're exclusively entrusted to the pastor? We say that sometimes the pastor may not be available, and um, so we don't want... We, we want people still to be able to be baptized and be married, etc., obviously. But also, we don't want to create problems of validity if we say that they these these uh, events must be done by the pastor or must be done by the pastor in the absence of a grave cause do we have to have a case to find if the cause was grave enough to have the the vicar administer the baptism so we're, we're saying that these events, they, they really fall to the pastor in the first instance. If you're the parochial vicar, you shouldn't take them upon yourself unless the pastor is absent or you check with him or he specifically asks you to do them. Um, what are some others? Uh, some other of these tasks, the functions that are especially but not exclusively entrusted to the pastor. We talked about baptism, confirmation, anointing, marriage conducting funerals, uh, acting on behalf of the parish as an entity, as a juridic person. Uh, he must reside in the parish, offering the Missa Pro Populo, the Mass for the people, every Sunday and Holy Day, and keeping the registers. Those are key, key functions the pastor is responsible for, but he may ask your help as a parochial vicar as well. Okay, um, what else? Other bodies in the parish. The, there are two, two new entities in the parish, just like we talked about two new entities in the diocese with the current code. One is the pastoral council, and the other is the finance council. Now, one is mandatory and the other is optional, uh, though most parishes have both, both a finance council and a pastoral council. What's interesting is the one that's mandatory is the finance council. A lot of people think it's the other way around, but a, par a parish must have a finance council, uh, and it is encouraged to have a, a parish council. Uh some people have the wrong idea of parish councils, and Woodall has a good discussion of this. Some people think that they um, they limit the pastor's authority. They don't. In fact, they're the they're advisory only, consultative only, and the pastor should preside over the parish council. Uh, and Woodall gives his opinion, saying there should not be a lay chair of the parish council. the The pastor should be the only chair. Uh, and then he also has his discussion of the the finance the finance committee. They help the pastor to administer the goods, the property of the parish, and also they're involved in uh, in budgets, etc. Um, okay, who who else? Okay, just uh, what all concludes by talking about some officials in the diocese. One you've probably heard of the the dean or the vicar forain. Um, the same same office. He's a he's really a uh, pastoral vicar, not really an ordinary, but a pastoral vicar. And his responsibilities really revolve a lot around the liturgy. He's to see to it that the liturgy is properly celebrated, that the blessed sacrament is uh, is properly secured, and the parish registers are are kept properly. And uh, he should visit the dean or the vicar forain. Uh, should visit the parishes in his deanery. Uh, then we have another uh, office called a rector. Uh, of course, we have a rector at our seminary, a very important position. This is rector in a different sense, and this is on 
page 176 of Woodall. This is uh, a priest who's in charge of a church, but it's not a parish church. So often a cathedral will have a rector. There won't be a, a cathedral. A, um, a cathedral might be a parish church, but it might not. It's different in different dioceses. So the the priest who's in charge may may be called rector of the cathedral, but that could be other other types of churches too. But they're non parochial, non parish churches. Uh, okay, and then we get to chaplains. What is a chaplain? Uh, a chaplain is a priest to whom pastoral care of a community or a special group is stably entrusted. And that's Canon 564. Some examples, um, seafarers, people on ships, migrants, other groups you can think of as uh, being entrusted to the care uh, of a chaplain. Uh, keep in mind, though, sometimes you will, um, you well, a student last year sort of cautioned that, look, in the secular realm, people sometimes think of a pastor more broadly, and uh, especially if you have Protestant, or I'm sorry, about think of a chaplain more broadly. So um, they may expect a chaplain in a hospital to do um, a number of things that uh, we would say only a only a, a priest could do. For instance, anointing, obviously. Would be would be a big one. So that's something you have to keep in mind if you're going to be working um, in a hospital. You have to be clear with the hospital what you're permitted to do and what you're not permitted to do. That is what church law allows you to do and what they don't. If they say, "Oh, we're thrilled you're here. You can distribute communion. You can anoint. You can hear confessions." You're like, well. I can distribute communion, but I, I cannot anoint and I, I cannot uh, hear confessions. So you just have to be clear that everybody understands what a Catholic chaplain is. Um, so a lay person, in our understanding of a chaplain, a lay person is not a, not a chaplain. Uh, but I want to tell you about, let's say you're forming a lay apostle, a lay association, and where our group is going to promote vocations. We're going to pray for vocations and support new vocations and so forth. Uh, and we might say, well, we need a, we need a chaplain for our, for our group. Let's get some priest who's sympathetic to our purposes and ask him to be our chaplain. That's, that's, that's fine. And it's fine to use the word chaplain Technically, though, it's an incorrect use of the word chaplain. Rather, uh, that person is really your spiritual advisor. The code, when it talks about the priest who's advising an association like that, uh, really speaks of a spiritual advisor, not really a chaplain. Your, your, your pastoral care, just because you've got this group that promotes vocations, your, your pastoral care isn't really entrusted to the spiritual advisor. He may really help your group, but you're probably all going to continue to go to your own parishes. You're going to get your pastoral care there. So it's not like you're you're on a ship and you're under the uh, you're relying on the the chaplain of the of the ship for your pastoral care. Okay, that's uh, that's the end. That's the end of. Lesson 8, and we only have one lesson to go. Our lesson 9 should have been Consecrated Life, but we're going to instead have a discussion next semester on that, uh, I hope. And our final lesson uh, for next week will be on the teaching office of the church. Thank you very much.